Good evening and welcome to all of you who have joined this evening. My name is Rabbi Phil Karish, and I work at the OU in the Department of Community Projects and Partnerships as their executive director and as well the director of Gen Aleph, the OU's response to some serious issues that we have here within the Jewish people that we need some work on. And I'm thrilled that you've all spared some time tonight to come join in this crucial and very holy initiative. Why are we all here tonight? I'd like you to take a moment to look at the picture that's on the screen. We have a very precious commodity, something that according to the research and according to the studies that we're losing at way too rapid a pace. In a 2013 Pew study, we learned that there is a significant number, the study indicated approximately a third of children who are raised Orthodox do not choose to identify as Orthodox when they're older. That's not a local issue to one community, and it's not an issue that's one part of the Orthodox community. It's across all cuts of the community. And the leadership of the OU is very troubled about this as well. We all should be troubled about it. So we started doing some research, and in order to maintain this remarkable commodity, not just of our children alone, though absolutely that's true, but even more broadly, the Masora, our Jewish tradition, Somebody asked Rav Shlomo Volba, I'm not sure what profession I should go into. Can you give me some etza? And Rav Volba said, you need to view our scenario now like it's wartime. If someone's bleeding and you're not a doctor or a nurse or an EMT, you know the basics. You take a gauze pad, a little bit of pressure. Try and stem the bleeding. So we're in a scenario now where we need to be looking out 25 years to the next generation of the Jewish people. And we need to ask ourselves, what can we do as an organization? What can we do as a shul or as a school? What can we do as parents and as individuals to ensure or to do our great part of trying to ensure the future of the Jewish people? As a response to this, we at the OU have built an initiative called Gen Aleph. Gen Aleph is a research-based program. It is uh, built off of data. It is easily accessible, as you will be able to access nearly all of our materials for free on our website, genaleph.org. And it is quite relatable to the Orthodox community. All of our resources have been built specifically for the Orthodox community. We're not going to go into all the details now, because really tonight is to have an opportunity to hear about Rabbi Glasser. But I will just drill down on one resource. And that is the resource of a podcast that we have put together over the last 18 months. The podcast that we have put together, as you can see, is built in a similar form as Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Maslow came up with this idea that if your basics are lacking, you can't self-actualize. We as parents are quite similar. We can't be concerned about generational continuity when we don't have our basics in order. So we've built a podcast based on this model, starting from the bottom, moving all the way to the top. And if you'd like, you can even take out your phones and you can scan the uh, QR code on the screen to sign up for the podcast. There are links up here on the screen. You can go to genoliveorg slash podcast as well to take advantage of this remarkable resource that's hosted by a dear friend and colleague, Rabbi Yair Menchel, uh, who uh, used to be in Kushner High School, now is a principal, and he works on our team as our director of community content and as the host of our podcast, The Jews Next Door. And it's because of these issues that we're seeing that when we reached out to the leadership here in Boca and really in Southern Florida in general, we got a pretty remarkable response. Um, and I'd like to take a moment to share with you who all of our partners are here in Southern Florida. And you can see them now on the screen and I'd like to thank each of them. Uh, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, who's here, uh, thank you very much for your partnership and for sharing your building with us, BRS, with Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg and Rabbi Phil Moskowitz, BRS West with Rabbi Rael Blumenthal, the Boca Jewish Center with Rabbi Yaakov Gibber, Katz Yeshiva High School with Rabbi Chaim Lanner and Mo Melissa Pearl, Katz Hillel Day School with Rabbi Yaakov Sadiq, Browser Maimonides Academy with Rabbi Yoni Fine, Shari Bina, Bira, Bina Torah Academy for Girls with Mrs. Esty Hamilton, their new head of school, and Young Israel of Hollywood with Rabbi Yosef Weinstock. Every single one of these people and the logos that you see here and the staff that works at these organizations are all invested in the same thing. 
And we're all concerned about the same thing. And that's why we're coming together tonight as a beginning, as a launch for a larger initiative that's going to be taking place here in southern Florida, here in Boca. Tomorrow, we're going to be having a training with a number of facilitators, people from the community, who are going to be trained in a special curriculum called Guiding Good Choices, one that will be taught here in the neighborhood over the course of the next many months, starting in November. And that will be taking place, the training will be taking place at Kat Yeshiva High School, all around, again, that same singular idea of what can we do to ensure the future of the Jewish people. I'd also like to take an opportunity, uh, in case you didn't get any text messages from the Ira Goldgrab, although I think all of you got a couple. Uh, she is our project coordinator here in Boca, uh, and she has done... I think she seems to have done a remarkable job of uh, making sure that everybody uh, knows about Jen Aleph and the launch that we're having tonight. Um, if you have any questions locally, uh, please feel free to reach out to Meira. She uh, is more than happy to help. I'd also like to introduce our Director of Operations, Talia Malatsky, who's here in the front. Uh, and as well, I mentioned about Rabbi Yair Menchel. And uh, the three of us comprise the team that is working um, around the clock to build out Jen Aleph, both here and in other communities. It is our aspiration this year to reach eight communities around the country with Jen Aleph and many more over the years to come. If this is something that you are passionate about, let us know. Find Meira, find Talia, find myself. We'll stick around afterwards to schmooze and talk. Let us know if it's something that you're interested in. And of course, the specific speaker for tonight, our keynote address, is by, uh, is by Rabbi Yaakov Glasser. Rabbi Yaakov Glasser has served as, as the Rav of Young Israel of Passaic Clifton for the past 17 years, where under his leadership, the congregation has grown dramatically and prides itself on the ideological and demographic diversity of its membership. Concurrently, Rabbi Glasser serves as the managing director for communal engagement at the Orthodox Union, where he leads the OU's efforts in engaging the Jewish community through numerous departments that focus upon synagogue development, organizational and communal partnerships, women's initiatives, Torah projects, innovation in nonprofits, and communal research. Rabbi Glasser has a rich background in Jewish life, previously serving as the David Mitzner Dean at the Center for the Jewish Future and University Life at Yeshiva University, the Regional Director of New Jersey NCSY, and the NCSY International Director of Education. In these capacities, Rabbi Glasser worked extensively with communities and schools across North America to create programs and implement ed educational curricula that inspire Jewish teens from across the spectrum of affiliation. A highly sought after speaker, Rabbi Glasser is renowned for combining humor, scholarship, and an upbeat message into his teaching. Rabbi Glasser and his wife, Doc Dr. Ruth Glasser, who serves as a director of guidance at Nala High School for Girls, Live, in the four, live with their four children in Passaic, New Jersey. Without further ado, thank you very much for flying down here, Rabbi Glasser. We'd love to give you the floor. Thank you so much, Rabbi Karish. It is a uh, honor and a privilege to be here. <clears throat> my, uh, my good friend, Rabbi Goldberg, my good friend, Rabbi Moskowitz, I see my good friend, uh, Rabbi Shemi Kamenetsky. Shemi Kamenetsky and I had children in the same hospital with the same doctor on the same night while working for the same organization and then named them the same name. <clears throat> but one of us moved to Boca Raton <laughs> and the other is living in New Jersey. <laughs> so Kaddish Baruch doesn't really have enough bracha to go around for everyone. But uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be here when I told my shul president that I was going to go to uh, Florida the week of Shabbat Shuvah. He only had one question, and that was, will it make the drusha shorter? So this morning, I found myself uh, saying goodbye to my youngest daughter. My youngest daughter, who is just starting high school this year, my daughter Meira. I walked into her room, and I said to her, Meira, Meira, it's time to get up for school. Just so you know, I will see you. I am uh, I'm going to Florida. So she says to me, Abba, tonight is back to school night. 
And I am so excited for you to meet my teachers. And one of them knew you and mommy when you were kids. And I want you to see because the school has a new building and it's going to be amazing. You should come to back to school. And I said, I'd love to come to back to school, but I have to go to Florida. So she goes, why are you going to Florida? So I said to her, I'm going to Florida because I'm going to give a speech. So she like looks very dejected and very deflated. And she goes, what are you speaking about, Yom Kippur? And I'm like, no, parenting. <laughs> so, I, uh, I stand with you. From amidst the struggle, the tension, the challenge, the overwhelming and constant clash of expectations, but also the effort and the well-meaning try your best reach that we all have to raise inspired, connected, wonderful, and healthy children. And it is true, tonight's program is about a launch that does not claim to have all the answers. It is a program that doesn't advance some sort of superstructure framework that could ensure that children emerge with the perfect balance in their emotional and spiritual lives. The program has one goal, and one goal only, and that is for us to all be better, for us to grow and advance in this very central and core element of our life. And the name of the program, as Rabbi Karish mentioned, is Guiding Good Choices. And while the formulation of this phrase was actually coined by some non-Jewish researcher in the University of Washington, I cannot think of a better phrase to capture the Torah's orientation towards parenting and, in fact, towards life. Because the totality of Torah and mitzvot in general essentially stand to help us in guiding good choices. And the truth is, the Torah writes, The Torah talks about the choices that we have to make in life. That Hashem says, standing from the heaven and from the earth, I place before you life and death. I place before you blessing and curse. And then the Torah tells us, And I want you to choose life. And the question is, what is the Torah advancing here? What do you mean choose life? Who wouldn't choose life? I had a Rebbe once in high school. This was a Rebbe who was extremely intense. And one day he was teaching, I don't really remember what, but I'm sure it had to do with a Ritva. And he's up there and he's going and finally he freezes and he looks at us and he goes, boys, when you die, which is always a great way to grab the attention of 14 year old boys, because mortality is really on our mind constantly. He goes, when you die, I'm telling you what's going to happen. You're going to go up there, and there's going to be a shtender and a gemara. And for some of you, this will be heaven. And for most of you, <laughs> this will be hell. Haidosi bochem esachayim v'yesamoves. Given a, a path towards the abyss of temptation or a path towards sanctity and meaning and purpose. Who wouldn't choose life? Why do I need a pasuk in the Torah to tell me? And the answer is that the choice is not what the Torah is introducing as the mandate. It's not about the choice. It's about the choosing. The Chiddush isn't Bachayim. The Chiddush isn't to embrace life. Who wouldn't want to embrace life? Who doesn't have a natural inclination? to the embracement of that which provides vitality and vibrancy to our world. The Chiddush of the Torah is ubacharta. The mandate here is not to live life passive to the pressures and habits of impulsive behavior, not to live life deferential to what's popular and familiar and comfortable, and not to live life by seeding control of our decisions to the societal rhythms of reality, but to live a life of ubacharta to live a life that we are not always in control of our circumstances and our conditions, but we are in control of how we react to them. 
to live a life with a Bechira mindset. And one of our greatest challenges as parents is generally not the Bachayim. It's not that we don't know what to do or what's right or what the answer is. Although true, there are circumstances, there are moments of unique obstacles that standard life experience is not enough to help provide guidance and direction in what we should do. But most moments of parenting Most moments of parenting position us not in the realm of questioning right and wrong, but in the realm of doubt, whether we should engage or we should let it go. Ubacharta means we live a life of choosing. That parents, the word parent is a noun. It describes what we are. I am a parent. And there is a parent conjugation that also relates to the word as a verb. We are a parent and we parent. And that transition, that transformationing, summoning that sense of intentionality and focus and infusing the landscape of our life with a dedication and devotion to look at every opportunity that presents itself for elevation, inspiration, guidance, direction, education, that is ultimately what the word ubacharta b'chayim is all about. When my wife and I got married, so my wife comes from a very, very academic family. Her father had a PhD from Princeton and her mother a PhD from some university in France that I can't pronounce. She grew up in a very, very academic home. I grew up in a home of Jewish communal service. This time of year was always very, very busy in my home. My father was the executive director of a synagogue of this size. I remember to this day him doing the seating for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur on a giant poster board. And I remember because the phones, you couldn't go outside. So as children of Jewish communal professionals, we knew everything. And I remember him sitting on the phone with this woman and he calls up this woman, Mrs. Horowitz, you know, Mrs. Goldberg has a new daughter-in-law. Do you mind moving over one seat so that we could put the new daughter-in-law next to Mrs. Goldberg? You'll be one seat over. And I must have been 10 or 11 years old and I hear from the other side of the phone, this is in Beverly Hills, Paul, drop dead. I didn't move for Hitler, and I'm not moving for you. (laughs) This is my world. This is where I came from. But my wife, she grew up with mamish like academics. And there's actually a great picture of the two of us at high school graduation of Eula. She is uh, holding the valedictorian award, the science award, the language award, the Midos award, all the math awards. And I am like this. So we came from different places. So my wife wanted to pursue a PhD in child psychology. But one of the things that we were struggling with is, as you know, to do a PhD. And often there are family obligations that come along at different points in time. It takes a very long time. It's a very big commitment. So we were struggling with whether or not we should embrace this goal. And she was hesitating and considering doing a much shorter graduate degree. So we met with one of our rabbeim, someone who we were very, very close with. We sit down with the rabbi and we present him this 22-year-old vision of the world that we had. We don't know if we should do the PhD. We want to be there for our children. We don't want to miss anything. We want to be present all the time. We want to be able to respond and react and do everything. Maybe we shouldn't take this degree. Maybe we should be on the whole time. Maybe she shouldn't do it. We go on and on and on. And he's sitting there and he's stroking his beard and he's listening. And finally he looks up and he says to me, what I consider to be one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten about parenting. And that is, he says to me, Yaakov, it's okay to mess them up a little. And I was like, oh, what? (laughs) It's okay to mess them up a little. And the truth is, it took me a long time to appreciate what he was saying. That trying to be perfect in this area of life in many ways creates anxiety within ourselves and within our children that undermines a healthy focus 
one that yields advancement in ourselves as parents and growth in our children, and we experience a sense of despondency when we feel like we can't do it all. And the reality is that there is no playbook for how to address every single one of the myriad of complexities entailed in raising children in our complicated world. The reality is that what a Torah approach to parenting is asking of us is not to be perfect parents and not to raise perfect children, but to bring the totality of ourselves into the effort, to be proactive, to be passionate, to be bacharta b'chayim, to approach each and every single day as an opportunity for love and engagement and elevation for these children. And I want to share with you an insight based upon an essay that Rav Soloveitchik wrote, an essay where he compares the Jew, the quintessential Jew, to a Sefer Torah. The Rav noted that the source of the notion that we tear Kriya when one encounters a situation of Avelos is based on a Gemara in Shabbos, Dome, why, why do we tear Kriya? Lesefer Torah Shenisrefa. Because the demise of a human being is like the burning of a Sefer Torah. And the Rav notes that while the parchment and the text may be essential components in the construct of a Sefer Torah, it is ultimately the sofer, the human scribe, with all of their piety, with all of their flaws, with all of their humanity, that evolves this parchment and ink into the most iconic embodiment of holiness in our religious life. And for the Rav, this means that within the capacity of every single waking Jew is the ability to create a Sefer Torah, and therefore we personify the sanctity that permeates that very special object. If you can create one, says the Rav, then you are one. And then the Rav applies this paradigm to Chinuch. And I'd like to extend his application for a few moments this evening. Inscribing the next generation of living Sifrei Torah, in raising the next generation of Jews who are going to encounter a complex world, transcend its obstacles and challenges, and contribute to the advancement of our people and the betterment of our society, we have to recognize that there are three elements that are core to our children's success that we are engaged with all the time. The first has to do with the klaf. A Sefer Torah is written on a piece of parchment. And that landscape upon which the Torah is written is the vessel that allows the Torah to exist altogether. As Rabbi Karish mentioned, for a number of years, I served as a, an outreach director in NCSY. And one of the things that we used to do is we used to go into public schools and run clubs for Jewish teens. And you can't just walk into a school and put up a sign that says, all Jews go to room 101. So what we used to do is we used to bring, it was amazing. We would walk through the halls of the school and free food would awaken the most dormant neshamas. It was unbelievable. We would, I would walk through the halls and all the other religions of children would be like, who is the short rabbi walking through the hall with pizza? And all the Jews followed us into room 101. And once in the room, we would try to create programming and experiences that spoke to these kids. So one time I brought a sofer, a scribe, to the club. Now, this I thought would be more hands-on. I thought it would be wonderful. Now, I don't know if you've interacted with a sofer, but sofers love to bring these like half-slaughtered animal hides to show you. You think your tefillin are so beautiful and black. Look, they come from this piece of neck that's been ripped off this, right? And they just love to pass these things around and they have hair on them and you're just, and you're the teacher in the class and you're trying to get into this, but mamish, like it's just, so he's passing the whole thing around and this one young woman stands up and screams. She goes, the Torah is written on a dead animal? I'm a vegetarian. So I did what any rabbi does in a situation like this. You lot. No, you t I told the child, I'm going, don't worry, I'm going to get you a vegetarian Torah. 
I'm going to get you a vegetarian door. So the next week I showed up at this school with an art scroll Tanakh. Okay? Apologies to Koran. With an art scroll Tanakh. And I handed it to the girl and I said, here is a kosher, here is a vegetarian Torah. And she looked at me and she said, Rabbi, the cover is leather. (laughs) Okay, okay. But we know that a kosher sefer Torah has to be written on a piece of parchment. And when initially purchased, the parchment is just a blank piece of paper. And it is radiating with potential of what it could become. And we often focus on the elements of chinuch related to conveying the substance and the values of our tradition, but in reality there is a very critical and foundational landscape upon which the entire success of this enterprise is contingent, and that is the klaf. Every child is a klaf. Every child is a landscape of opportunity and emotional stability and social skills and resilience, and self-esteem, all coalesce to comprise a vessel that's even capable of receiving and holding on to our value system. And so part of our job as parents, and much of what the program invests in, is in helping us guide them to just grow to be solid, stable, normal people. As I've heard quoted many times, sanity before sanctity. I didn't hear that in Smeichel. The notion that part of our mandate in raising our children is to relate to their self-confidence, to relate to their sense of self. How do they feel about themselves? How are they at making friends? Who are their friends? How do they handle life when they don't get what they want? What are their coping skills? From where do they derive a sense of self-confidence? What are their talents and abilities? And how could we nurture them? How do their unique capacities and challenges position them? as a source of growth and not defeat. And each cloth, each piece of parchment comes from a different source because the parchment for each Torah emerges as unique because each child foundational landscape is unique. It is distinct. And as parents, it is our job to listen and to engage and to make intentional choices based on a true understanding of the particular parchment that defines this child. And often, even within the same family, we have such different children. I have two kids in Eretz Yisrael this year. One kid went to Eretz Yisrael, was very independent. We never heard from them. Another kid went to Eretz Yisrael, who was during COVID. There were lots of rules and lots of restrictions. The kid who is now in Eretz Yisrael, we speak to them more often than we spoke to them at home. When people ask me how many people are at home, I say all of them are at home. Different kids need different types of engagement from an emotionality standpoint, from a consciousness standpoint, and part of Ubacharta, part of bringing intentionality to the world of parenting is to be mindful of their uniqueness and their differences and what makes them who they are. A Sefer Torah also stands as a radiating source of substance, of Torah values. For a Sefer Torah to be kosher, it has to also contain the totality of the text of our Chumash. And the second fundamental responsibility we have towards our children is to concern ourselves with their religious and their spiritual development. To not delegate this entirely to their schools and to their teachers. Rather, to establish what this program strives to do, and what many of our schools strive to do, and are successful at doing, to establish a concurrent and mutually reinforcing dynamic, whereby both the choreographed spiritual world of the school and the natural habitat of the home are aligned in their effort to teach Torah, to instill a sense of commitment for standards of observance of mitzvot, and of course inspire a belief and an awareness in the presence of the Rabboni Shalom in their life. And one of the most fundamental differences between the Sefer Torah and the thousands of chumashim that sit on our shelves in our shuls is that each chumash is an absolute replica of the other. And one could never imagine within a single printing run discovering a variance between texts, styles, or pagination. They're all printed the same. Sifri Torah are written by human beings. And even the greatest sofrim are scribing these texts by hand, and the substance 
of the texts are not, well, the substance of the texts are identical. The style and the form can vary greatly. Just as the emotionality of our children differ greatly one from the other, so does the spiritual profile of their souls. Kishem shem partzuseyam enan shabos. Kach ein deoseyam enan shabos. They think differently. Their souls awaken to different things. For some of them it will be music. For some of them it will be thought. For some of them it will be activity. For some of them each one relates to the world of Torah and mitzvahs differently. For some, davening in shul can be extensive, and for others, it should be more limited. Some can devote themselves more to Torah learning, and for some, chesed, and action, and engagement has to be more of a stronger portion of that proportion. Chanoch lenar al pidarko, Rav Kook would always say, presumes the presence of a derech that each child is reached in a particular way. And so while both the emotionality of our children are different and unique, so too is the spiritual profile of our children. And part of the mindfulness and intentionality that we bring to the world of parenting is to consider the uniqueness of each child. And it's challenging because I don't know how it works in your home, but in my home, there is no value that has greater significance in this world than that of fair. Fair towers over everything. It's not fair. And part of the discerning need that we have as parents is to be able to recognize when sometimes we have to compromise on the democratization of our parental approach in order to ensure that each child is getting what they need. Because ultimately, if we are able to reach the spark of uniqueness that animates who they are, and everyone is getting what they need, then while the temporary pushback may be a certain sense of rebellion against the lack of justice with which we are governing the enterprise that is our home, but nevertheless, there will be an internal advancement, an actualization of their potential, a growth that moves beyond these elements that sometimes hold us back. And finally, even if one has a beautiful piece of cloth, and even if one can account for the presence of an elegant and artistic rendition of the text, the most fundamental aspect of infusing sanctity into our Torah, A Torah is not a Torah just because there's a cloth, and a Torah is not a Torah just because it has all of the words. A Torah becomes a Torah because there's a sofa, there's a person behind it. And the Rav explains so beautifully that the sanctity of a Torah is an outcome of the individual character and personality of the sofa. They summon their humanity and identity, their thoughts, their dreams, their aspirations, all of which are contained in the words that we are reading from that Torah each and every Shabbos. And one of the most essential gifts that we can give our children in our contemporary world that is so challenging is giving them the totality of ourselves, our attention, our priority, and our being. My son, one night uh, I had flown, I travel a lot, so one night I had come back from Eretz Yisrael late that afternoon, and I was beyond exhausted, like walking zombie exhausted. I hope I didn't pass in any Shilas, but I was in Passaic, so I just told everyone it was awesome. (laughs) So I'm walking around, and I literally have no, like, no consciousness. My wife tells me, we're going to parent-teacher conferences. It's tonight. I said to her, please have mercy, right? I'll do anything. I'll wash the dishes, I'll mop the floor, I'll whatever, and she's like, we're going to parent-teacher conferences. I'm like, I don't even, when I go to parent-teacher conferences with you, I feel like I'm like the parent intern in this conversation. I don't even feel like, I feel like the two of you are kind of like, yeah, yeah, we'll tell him like what he, you know what I mean? Like, I don't even really feel like, I'm not sure how much I'm really contributing 
to this dynamic. One year she was traveling and I went on my own and I told the teacher, the friends of a different daughter that, I mean, it's really, really, so she says to me, no, we're both going. The kids have to see, you know, we have to be engaged, we have to be involved, we have to be intentional. And she's a psychologist. She got the PhD in the end, thank God. So she, um, so we go to parent-teacher conferences and we come home. I have three daughters and a son in Kanai Nahara. Precious gifts from my Kodesh Baruch. My son comes barreling down the stairs and he says to me, Abba, Abba, how are parent-teacher conferences? And I said, oh, Chaim, they were amazing. Your teachers love you. They think you're incredible. You're doing so well. So much nachas. We're so proud of you. And he goes, Abba, tonight were the girls' parent-teacher conferences. <laughs> we owe our kids the totality of ourselves. A large portion of parenting is not tactical. It's just presence. It's just being there to give of ourselves, to ensure that they experience the love and the anchoring stability and the nurturing reality that there is someone in this world who believes that they are the most important thing in the world. Someone who'll drop everything, not only in moments of crisis, but also in moments of calm. Someone who'll engage with their undivided attention. You know, we, we once took a family trip we do a lot of family trips, and we do RVing. So we, we RV'd across the United States once, so we did the Pacific Northwest. If you really want to see what your marriage is made of, by the way, just take you, your wife, and your family into a truck for two weeks, and you'll get a, really, you'll get a sense of what the elasticity is of that particular dynamic. Anyway, so someone convinced me that the only way to really be present um, is, is not to bring your phone at all. Not to bring your phone at all. So we all know all the phone, Tyra. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to do it. So we were going to the airport because we were flying to San Francisco and renting the RV and going all over the Pacific Northwest. And I did it. I did it. I left my phone on my dresser at home, on my dresser at home, gave everyone my wife's number, and I did disconnect from the phone. And I have to tell you, I sat in the car on the way to Newark Airport and I mamish never realized just how disgusting Newark really is. <laughs> it was unbelievable. <laughs> but after Newark, after Newark, right? It's like when you take off from Newark and people say, how was your flight? It just always gets better than that, you know? You could be going to Kabul and they're like, Hashem, we're 20,000 feet. So, you know what? You're there, you're present, you're with them. You feel connected to them. And it's not just about the attention, the tactical attention. Because believe me, I have so many of these, I have so many of these uh, gimmicks and, and, and what are they called? Life hacks on how to have as many people think that you're giving them. My shul thinks I'm giving a shear to them right now. <laughs> they have no idea. So, but, there's nothing that replaces the sofa, the humanity and the reality and just the, the, the presence of person. And that is so much of what we try to bring to our kids. The sofa, aside from the individual and his talents and experiences that he brings, it's just he himself. So to be the scribes of our children's life, we also, we also have to recognize that we have to bring the essence of who we are. And when bringing the essence of who we are, we all know that even though the Sefer Torah all look the same. My parents uh, purchased the Sefer Torah for their anniversary a number of years ago, a few years ago. We had a beautiful Shabbos in a hotel. Everyone got COVID. It was amazing. So then we came back to Passaic and no one had it anymore. So we, uh, we, so they got a Torah. But I remember when my father was choosing the Torah, he showed me five different klafim. And I said, oh, he figured, oh, you're the rabbi in the family. Like, you know, you should be good for something. Like, you know, you're machmer on two days yantif in Israel. So, like, just give us something here. So can you help us pick the cloth? I'm like, well, what's the difference? Why do they cost different amounts of money? So he starts explaining to me. They're written by different people. And 
this person lives a life of exceptional piety. They go to the mikvah every time they write Shem Hashem, and, and this person's known to be an aged sage of Yerushalayim, and this person's ten generations, and this person's... A, you can't tell from the klaf, but the Torah's, its kedusha is reflective. Also, the quality of the kedusha, of the standing example of the sofer, of the manner in which the sofer embodies what it is that they are trying to transmit. And that's why to really be the sofer in our children's Torah, we have to embody what it is that we're transmitting. We have to think long and hard about how we model what it is that we're trying to give over to them. How we handle ourselves, and not just in the world of Torah, in the world of emotionality also. Not just how we relate to davening and learning, and how we, we speak about situations that are out of control, and how we deal with, with challenge and adversity and disappointment and disillusionment, and how we relate to figures and leaders when we're commenting on them. All of that transmits into the final product. You may not see it right away, because the word Avraham is written with the same depth of black D.O., of black ink, that it would be written otherwise. But somehow, as it manifests itself, when they grow up and they evolve and become leaders and members of their community, the habits and the realities that they internalize from what we model is so much part of what this is about. So my friends, Hashem has entrusted us with these incredible gifts. We're not going to be perfect, and we're going to mess them up a little. But we have to always remember that we're not necessarily in control of the outcomes. But if we work individually, if we work as a home, if we work as a community, we can help them to connect and to inspire and to elevate their lives. We can help them develop a sense of passion and care and concern for others and for Ruchnius and what we stand for. We can develop tools and insights. We can give each other encouragement. And we as a community could help engage the next generation, not from a disposition of, oh my gosh, look at these Gen Zers, they don't want to do anything but begin to penetrate a little deeper and appreciate they bring dimensions of passion and enthusiasm and interest that are unique to their generation. And if a Kodesh Baruch Hu gave them to us, then he believes in them and he believes in us. All we have to do is write. So Be'ezer Hashem, with the launch of this beautiful program, we will be able to continue together with Siata Deshmaya, and with, of course, tremendous tefillah, we will be able to advance in our approach to how we relate to our children, and of course, in how, our, how we relate to the perpetuation of the Mesora that we are trying to instill within them, and to be able to raise a generation of healthy and passionate, inspired young men and women. Have a wonderful night. Gemar Chasim <clears throat> Thank you so much, Rabbi Glasser. Uh, there is no better time than now to start taking strides and start to take steps towards us being better parents. We have so many resources that we'd love to share with you. Take out your phones. Feel free to scan the ones that you're interested in. Starting the day after Yom Kippur, our newsletter will be coming out. Um, the About Us page will take, us, take you to our website, which explains a lot about Gen Aleph and all of the various resources that we have. And as mentioned earlier, we have the podcast as well. If you are interested in getting involved, please find Meira. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the program, please find myself. Please find Talia Malatsky. Rabbi Glasser will be here as well for a few minutes. And Meira, I'd like to thank again BRS and all of our organizational partners and thank all of you for taking time during your Aserah Shimei to come out and join us, wishing you all a Gemar Chasimatova.